Now, on the issue of capital regulation, and let me just say a word or two and then get to really the main subject for today. Uh, uh, on one hand, you think of capital regulation as good. It is because there's more capital uh, to protect, if it's a commercial bank, uh, the depositors, in, excuse me, to, to protect you and I as taxpayers because we guarantee the deposits. Um, the, the capital side of the bank, uh, the capital account for a bank assets and liabilities and virtually, for a commercial bank at least, virtually all the funding source are deposits which are federally insured and then there's this little strip of capital, I think 10% is what they were shooting for before and, and as the assets on this side get written down, what gets written down is the capital and so basically the capital account is in the first loss position and what it really protects is uh, the depositors, and it's quite possible, as we've had in this uh, meltdown, that the size of the losses are well beyond the capital. Uh, I, I showed you some of the pricing of the of the residential mortgage-backed securities. Even investment grade is three cents on the dollar. Um, double A and A is like three cents on the dollar. So basically, if you really you know uh, valued their assets at market. Um, now, uh, and liquidated the bank be because it no longer has sufficient capital, possibly maybe you can get 50% of, of value for those assets, then you've got to pay the depositors off, and guess who gets the bill for the difference? This amount. You guys do. <laughs> and unfortunately, I do too. I get my share of that too. So basically, having more capital protects you and I. So I could sell, well see easily that the level of capital rises as a result of this because we have really been, we're really going to get a big bill uh, for all this. I mean, a very large bill. Um, and so that's one thing. But the other thing is, it's not just you've got to raise the capital, but the real issue is not just having higher capital because uh, what happened um, is we instituted something called um, prompt corrective action where if the bank had capital of 10% and, uh, and even, let's say they're fully in compliance, okay, they're at the, they're the 10% minimum. They made the minimum. So all you have to do is lose 1% of your assets and you're no longer in capital compliance. And then on top of that, they put in some uh, leg, uh, legislation that required prompt corrective action, PCA which means you're given 90 days to get that capital account up. And that's not much time. Uh, Citibank managed one or two times, and basically that's not enough time. In fact, you've got to give them a capital restoration plan in 45 days, and they give you 45 days to execute. And by law, you're supposed to put the bank into the receivership, sell the assets, and, um, and hopefully s stop the losses, the hemorrhaging, before it gets too bad. Uh, that's fine and dandy, by the way, that kind of thing, if, if failures occur one at a time. But when the whole system fails, we found out that we couldn't do that because the cost to us would have been exorbitant. But here's my point. Um, if we got comfortable in thinking that we raised the capital requirement where it used to be 6%, now up to 10%, that really doesn't stop the fact that you lose 1% capital, you immediately have to go into receivership if you lose any capital. The real issue is to keep capital above the minimum. So you've got to have excess capital. And that really is already there in, in the form of loan, loan loss reserves. Now, in this, uh, in this last meltdown that we went through, the aggregate loan loss reserves of the combined balance sheet of the banking system in the United States was about 1.2%. 1.2 percent. We're looking at <laughs> we're looking at 70, 80, 90 percent write downs of assets. So basically, all you have to lose is 1.2 percent, and you're already not making the minimum. And then you already and you have to run out and raise new capital. So my guess is that if you're going to resurrect the system to have a greater shock absorber, it's not only a higher level of required capital to 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 you know protect us as depositors, excuse me, as taxpayers, but on top of that, have excess capital above it as a buffer. And without that, you can't ever go to mark-to-market uh, -market accounting. Because what's 1%? My goodness gracious, that's one day's market volatility. <laughs> uh, 
You know, that's, that's nothing. That's absolutely nothing. So it, it's loan loss reserves or some kind of excess capital buffer. And I think they're doing this in Sweden to the extent of about 5%. And I don't think that's even enough. If you're going to do, and, and Jim thought that, what, marked market accounting is going to come back in some other form. But if you're going to really truly go back to marked market accounting, you're going to have to have, a, have, a, have an excess buffer above that by well more than 5%, which means banking is no longer as, as leveraged a game. Um, one or two other observations I want to uh, throw out. Uh, another thing that's going to happen, uh, and it always happens, <laughs> is that when an asset class collapses and banks fail and you and I get the bill, or there's economic disruption and we get the bill for it, virtually every time they respond with another kind of regulation, which is what assets can that entity hold? And what gets on the blacklist is those assets that fell in the past. Well, we already are in a situation at this point where the number of assets that regulated institutions can hold in the United States is so narrow um, that uh, there's hardly anything left. <laughs> there's hardly anything left. Um, because anything that's been in, had a crisis in the past has been blacklisted. Um, and, if, and if regulation doesn't blacklist it, what's really kind of interesting is the, there's self-regulation self by the parties involved. Uh, it, it, there's a, something in, in today's Wall Street caught my eye. Harvard cuts risk and all the bond managers leave because basically they told the bond managers you only buy uh, high investment grade paper. Um, so basically that's what's going to happen. Uh, is that they're going to narrow the list. Now, that was kind of interesting. It doesn't mean that there's less risk, because actually there's more risk, Be, uh, because we get a lot of perverse, uh, unintended consequences of, of regulation. And one of them is if they just narrow the list that institutions can buy, it means the prices are higher and the yields are lower, and then the institution doesn't have no, enough in, investment income to keep, keep operating profitably. And that's exactly what's happening. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm chairman of a, a, an investment committee for an insurance company, and uh, if you really want to be stay within the confines of all the blacklists, you're, you're left with very few assets, and those assets are so under so highly demanded because there's so few relative to the pool of capital after them that the prices are so high, the yields are so low that we're running. Uh, our investment income is just shattered, and our bottom line, top line, and bottom line are 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 are, are, are hurting very badly. So we're going to almost have to defy the regulators to reach out beyond the the, the boundaries of their narrow constraints um, to uh, bring in something else, and we're, that becomes more of a problem. becomes more and more of a problem. But anyway, the point is that all these things are going to have to get hashed out because we're so much more vulnerable to the inflow of foreign capital when we're even the United States is a small, small potato. What are we, I'm, our consumer is 18% of the world. I'm not sure what our financial holdings are relative to the world. My guess is it wealth, what is financial wealth? 40% of the world or something like that? It's no longer the majority. It's no longer the majority. So that foreign capital can overflow us with all kinds of unintended consequences if we build it into regulation. So uh, the point is, any regulatory change has to recognize the international nature of, of, of finance these days. So these are the kind of things that are, are heading our way, and um, I'm not sure how it's going to come out, but uh, uh, since you do this in a crisis environment, it doesn't come out well, usually. <laughs> but we, we don't know for sure. Um, so anyway, that's, that much, that's all I have to say about what usually is this arcane, arcane subject of regulation, <laughs> which usually puts people right to sleep, but uh, th these are major concept, conceptual issues that have to be addressed. All right, now let me get back to the intended um, uh, line of discussion tonight. Um, we've already uh, spent uh, um, uh, and, uh, actually two hours talking about how the foreign capital came to the United States and it overflowed our institutions and it got heavily directed uh, to um, housing via derivatives, residential mortgage-backed securities, and uh, it ended up... Um, uh, what's the word? Uh, overdoing it in the sense that we ran out of qualified borrowers who could pay the loans off, which ended up uh, being the trigger point for the, for the the beginning of the meltdown. It turns out that the that the mortgages, residential mortgage back, residential mortgages, 
we're really supporting the residential mortgage-backed securities, which were a major asset on the banks, the, uh, the investment banks and commercial banks, both the United States and abroad. And so uh, when we got into that situation, uh, the financial institutions melted down because of those excesses in, um, in U.S. borrowing. Um, then, uh, so we had a financial crisis. We had a financial meltdown, the likes of which we have not really seen in this country since the Depression. And prior to that, it would be, a, we have to go back to the, the previous, the, excuse me, the 19th century, the 1800s in the United States. So it's been a long time since we've seen such tr utter systemic meltdown. Um, and I, first, the first discussion, I went through all the processes of the meltdown, uh, how it happens once, once you get it going. Uh, and I'm not going to repeat that, but the point uh, where I'm going today is that we start with a financial crisis. The financial crisis, which is where we've been so far, also ends up being an economic crisis, and that's where we are now. Um, the, the central bank jumped into the market last November when the banking system was melting down so precipitously, um, and effectively the, the central bank became the replacement private bank and made loans of a trillion dollars in about a month. Um, and replay and did an awful lot of financing of all finance, all kinds of financial institutions, as well as uh, U.S. corporations um, in competition with the banks. Uh, they became the banker de facto in America, so it it, it at least slowed down the momentum uh, of the of the um, of the meltdown. Now we're at the point where we've got to look at the economic meltdown that results from the financial meltdown, and I think that's becoming front and center these days. Matter of fact. Again, looking at today's paper, markets fall on growth fears, i.e. the growth of the economy. So um, the usual situation in a post-war economic um, uh, expansion and contraction is that generally the economy turns down first and it pulls the financial market with it because as the economy performs poorly, the returns and the ability to support loans um, uh, uh, is deter deteriorates and you start having loan losses. So generally in the post-war period, the last 50 years since the Depression, 60 years since the Depression, the, the economic rhythms are the economy goes down and it takes the financial markets down. This is a very different one. The financial markets went into calamitous shock and then it was, we kind of put a bottom under it by the Fed last November and now we're really feeling the economic vibrations. And the economic vibrations from this um, are getting to be pretty severe. It would have been far more severe had the Fed not jumped into the market. Uh, but it, we're, we have a unique event on our hands, an economic uh, calamity on our hands. Um, and it's something called a debt deflation. On these axes, if we, we calculate uh, the change, the percentage change in GDP uh, on this axis, and and everything from zero it, this way is positive, so one, two, three, four, five, and everything in this direction is negative, the economy is shrinking, so in other words, here we have plus GDP growth, and here we have minus uh, GDP, minus GDP in this direction. We can also characterize an economy not only by whether it's growing or not, positive or negative, but you can also characterize an economy by whether or not it's inflating or deflating. And uh, if it's inflating, we measure the in, uh, inflation in this direction, or we make note of it in this direction, and you can have positive inflation rates and you can have negative, which is called deflation. So you can have deflation and inflation and you have positive growth and negative growth. Now this is, was kind of, um, um, well, it, it, it kind of defies the <coughs> usual logic. Because for the most part, and by the way, once we, once we start to characterize economies by this, we have to give it a name. So the name I, I call this is Q1, Quadrant 1. Quadrant 1 is the normal situation where you have positive GDP growth and positive inflation rates. This is what we've occurred, occurred in the United States for the great majority, not completely, but the great majority of the post-war period. Uh, the other possibility is Quadrant 2, uh, which, and you get there for different pressure, different ways you get there, where the economy is growing, but with deflation. Well, we haven't hardly seen that, although the closest we came to it was the tech, the tech boom of um, uh, the 1990s, early 2000. Actually, at, in 2002, 2003, we got down to a zero, a zero inflation rate and, and positive growth. So we almost got there. 